Welcome to the Nietzsche Krishna Buddha Christ series. So this is the first video in this series. It's going to be a long series because I'm going to be going over most of Nietzsche's many books. But in this one, part one, the subtitle is A Key to Nietzsche's Riddles in the Birth of Tragedy. Heracles equals Krishna. Dionysus equals Shiva. So the overall theory of this Nietzsche Krishna Buddha Christ series is that Friedrich Nietzsche, who was raised, he was born in 1844. His father was a Lutheran pastor. Both of his grandfathers were Lutheran pastors. Many other members of his lineage were Christian pastors. And he was going to become a pastor himself. His father died just before he turned five, then his baby brother died soon after that. He grew up in a household of women, his mother and his sister and his aunts and his grandmother. And he was expected to follow in his forefather's footsteps by becoming a Lutheran pastor. And he was a very pious child. The other children called him little pastor. He could recite scripture with sincerity he would write prayers to God, heartfelt prayers, and desiring to become a martyr for Christ. So he was a very religious child. But then after his first semester in college, when he came back home for Easter break, he refused to go to Mass and take communion, which shocked his mother, and he became an atheist. I am saying, after about five years of atheism, Nietzsche returned to a form of Christianity when he encountered the theory that the stories of Jesus Christ in the Bible are based on the older stories of Krishna, the Hindu god Krishna, understood as the original form of Vishnu. So there's several branches of Hinduism. The main three are Vishnu worshippers, Shiva worshippers, and Shakti worshippers, the goddess worshippers. They all acknowledge the divinity of the other gods, but the question comes down to who's the primary original source of everything. So the Vaishnavas, the Vishnu worshippers say, Vishnu is the original god, the monotheistic god, but with many forms. And that in some branches of this Vaishnava branch of Hinduism, believe that Krishna, the flute playing, dancing philosopher god, is the original form of Vishnu. So I'm saying that Nietzsche, encounter these theories about the stories of Christ being based on the stories of Krishna. He had already become enamored with Hindu philosophy, specifically the Vedanta philosophy of India, such as Krishna's Bhagavad Gita by reading Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American transcendentalist, and Arthur Schopenhauer, both of whom were very impressed with Hindu philosophy. Arthur Schopenhauer was an atheist. His interpretation was Shankara's 8th century common era interpretation of the Vedanta philosophy. Uh, so I'm getting bogged down in some details here, but the bottom line is after five years of atheism, I'm saying Nietzsche encountered these theories about Krishna and Buddha and Christ all being linked together through literary parallels and that he came back to believe in God in the form of Krishna. But he hid that belief in his first book by reenacting the theological practice of the Greeks who followed Alexander the Great into India. They equated the Indian gods with their own Greek gods, and specifically they equated Krishna with the Greek god Heracles, who the Romans called Hercules, and they equated Shiva with the Greek god Dionysus. So for those of you who have read Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music, you know that his main characters are Dionysus and Apollo. But he also mentions Heracles in sections 10 and 19. And the way he mentions Heracles, it's, it's always in relation to Dionysus and the relationship is such that Dionysus is a subordinate emanation from the more primary source, Heracles. So I am saying in The Birth of Tragedy, when Nietzsche writes the name Heracles, he means Krishna. And when he writes the name Dionysus, he means Shiva. 
And I'll go on to explain that when he writes Apollo, he means Shiva's wife, the goddess Maya. Nietzsche openly equates Apollo with the veil of Maya in section one of The Birth of Tragedy. And I'll get into the details um, of all the, the inner workings of The Birth of Tragedy, which is a very difficult book in the attempt at a self-criticism, the, the preface Nietzsche added to The Birth of Tragedy in 1886. After he published it in 1872, he called it an impossible book. And we'll go over the attempt at a self-criticism in this video, where in several places he alludes to the fact that there is an unannounced riddle in The Birth of Tragedy, which he more or less announces in the attempt at a self-criticism. And it has to do with the name Dionysus, which is a mask for some unknown god who he also calls the Antichrist. So there's so many working parts with Nietzsche and so that's why I've been reluctant to uh, put out this video because I'm just seeing how difficult it's going to be to explain in an engaging way that doesn't lose people in the details. But the overall theory that I have is that after coming back to a belief in God and Christ via this theory of the literary parallels between Krishna and the stories of Buddha and the stories of Jesus Christ, he hid that devotion to Krishna, his Christian devotion to Krishna, behind the Greek gods in The Birth of Tragedy, and then in his middle and late period books, he wore the mask of an atheist. So he was an atheist from about 1865 to 1870, I'm saying, and then he returned to, to theism in the form of devotion to Krishna, but then around 1878, he started wearing the mask of an atheist again. And I'm saying his, and then he also said at some point that I could become the Buddha of Europe. I could be the Buddha of Europe. So according to the Vaishnava school of Hinduism, Buddha is one of Krishna's Vishnu avatars. Krishna descends to earth in the form of an atheist, Buddha, to preach to the atheistic people of the time to get them to start following religious regulations from a philosophical perspective that they'll be able to accept. So when Nietzsche says, I could be the Buddha of Europe, my theory is that he meant Krishna's atheistic Buddha avatar, who's God disguised as an atheist, and that his purpose was to bring the Western world away from faith in God so as to prepare the Western world to return full circle to the original God of Christ, which is Krishna. That's the overall theory. And that theory makes more sense when you see in The Birth of Tragedy that he was equating Krishna and Shiva with Heracles and Dionysus, just like the Alexandrian era Greeks did. All right, so there's the basic run through. And already I'm sure this seems a little bit not a little bit, it probably seems very confusing, but if you think about the importance of Nietzsche in the history of Western thought, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say there's two bookends to this history of Western philosophy with Plato at one end, Plato the disciple of Socrates who wrote the dialogues in which Socrates expresses philosophy, and I would say Nietzsche at the other end. And Nietzsche is the man who said God is dead. He talks about being the prophet of the Antichrist, so he's very controversial. But I am saying that he did believe in God, and he was being intentionally controversial with his flamboyant atheism for the purpose of bringing us back around to the original God of Christ. So another part of this theory is in The Birth of Tragedy, he calls openly for a rebirth of the tragic culture of ancient Greece. The tragic culture meaning the religious celebrations of the tragic plays, which were choreographed by the, the playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides in the 5th century BCE Greece. So that is what Nietzsche is studying in The Birth of Tragedy. He dedicated the book to the, to the composer Richard Wagner, with whom he later broke, they were originally sort of a 
quasi-father-son relationship, and Nietzsche dedicated the book, uh, The Birth of Tragedy. Here's one of the versions that I use. Um, this is Douglas Smith. I also use Walter Kaufman's version when I'm analyzing The Birth of Tragedy in this series. Um, so he dedicated the book to Richard Wagner. He talks about the power of music, the spirit of music, the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music. So music, says Nietzsche, following Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, who combined Shankara's 8th century common era atheistic school of Vedanta philosophy with Immanuel Kant's philosophy. That's what Arthur Schopenhauer did. Very, very soon after Nietzsche renounced Christianity, he discovered Arthur Schopenhauer's world as will and representation, and he had a religious conversion to that philosophy, which brought him to the Vedanta philosophy at first atheistically. I'm arguing after a few years, he began to realize that after Shankara, there emerged in India in the Middle Ages, the Vaishnava reformers, beginning with Ramanuja and culminating with Chaitanya in the 16th century. The Vaishnava schools of Vedanta say that there is a personal God, Vishnu. He has many forms, but it's a monotheistic God. And there are eternal individual souls, Atman. Whereas Shankara said that the talk of personal gods and eternal individual souls, while well, he did believe in demigods and eternal, and not eternal souls, but reincarnating souls, he believed they were temporary and should be merged back into the more fundamental and impersonal, impersonal ground of being called Brahman. <clears throat> Schopenhauer called Brahman the will. So Nietzsche is famous for his concept of the will to power. Well, that's rooted in his understanding of Schopenhauer's concept of the universal will, the ground of being from which all of the phenomenal forms in space and time emerge from which the illusion of the material world emerges, including, says Schopenhauer, the illusion of an eternal individual self. The Vaishnavas say, no, we are eternal individual selves. Yes, the material body is temporary and illusory, but there's a higher level of illusion, eternal illusion, which they call yoga maya, in the spiritual world, where the individual souls interact with the personal form of God on these spiritual planets, the Vaishnavas, Vaikuntha is the name of the spiritual world, and there's, they're filled with spiritual planets. The central one of which, according to the Gaudiya Vaishnava school of Vedanta, founded by Chaitanya in the 16th century, is Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna's cow planet, where Krishna enjoys with his eternal paramour Radharani and all of the cowherd villagers and their cows in a celestial paradise where every species is entirely God conscious and blissful. Even the water, even the soil, everything is made, these eternal forms of knowledge and bliss is what that world is made of. So I'm jumping around here, I know from all these different concepts, but bringing it back to the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music, music, says Schopenhauer, is a direct copy of the underlying will whereas other art forms like sculpture and painting imitate the illusory forms that emerge from the will so music gets us down to the heart of being and what nietzsche is saying is that music when it accompanies these tragic plays featuring actors wearing the mask of the god dionysus because music is down at the ground of being where the eternal forms of knowledge, Plato's absolute ideas exist. So that's another complicated piece of this puzzle. It draws out the archetypal significance of the figures on the stage. And it puts us in touch with our eternal, with the eternal absolute ideas that Plato talked about. So that music can bring to life these archetypal forms that are imprinted on our well, he wouldn't call it a soul because he's following Schopenhauer at this point, but it's imprinted on this collective will of which each of us is a part and parcel. It brings it to life, the underlying reality, 
And so the, it might seem like sort of an illusory world, the world of theater. Nietzsche is saying it was a spiritual technology that enabled the Greeks to perceive the God literally on the stage because the music would draw out the eternal form of the God behind the mask. Okay, so that's what he says overtly, that Europeans should resurrect this ancient Greek tragic culture, which enables us to perceive the personified form of the underlying will of whom we are all parts and parcels, and that through a compassionate sense of service to the God, European culture could be revitalized. That's the overt message, and I'm saying underlying that overt message is a call not to resurrect the extinct religion of the Greeks, but to embrace the still living and even more ancient religion centered on Krishna. And that Nietzsche, as the son of a Lutheran pastor, as a devout Christian throughout his whole life, except for these five years of atheism, saw himself as a devotee of Krishna, that he had been worshiping Krishna all along and he didn't know it until he discovered this link between Krishna and Christ. And that is what he's trying to bring Europe to do, to embrace the underlying religion that Europeans, that the Western world has always embraced. So then I go on to say, on the second page of this first part one of this series, um, let me just read it here. I said, I argue that Nietzsche's veiled prophecy began coming true in 1966 when his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, founded the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in the United States of America, from where he and his disciples spread the ecstatic Hare Krishna movement throughout Europe and around the globe in the late 1960s and 70s. So what Nietzsche is calling for in The Birth of Tragedy I am saying, came to pass about a hundred years later when a Brahmin from India, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, whose devotees call him Srila Prabhupada, brought the Hare Krishna movement, which is the popular name for the Gaudiya Vaishnava school of Vedanta that I talked about earlier, and he trained up the young people that he met about the Krishna's philosophy in the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavad Purana, also known as Srimad Bhagavatam, and he taught them to chant in the streets the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So the power of music to bring the myth to life. And I say, all right, as a barometer of the cultural success of this movement, it was embraced for a while by the most famous rock and roll band ever, the Beatles. And George Harrison, the lead guitarist of the Beatles, became especially enthralled with the Hare Krishna movement. And he eventually produced the famous Hare Krishna anthem, My Sweet Lord, in 1970. So the kind of cultural impact that Nietzsche was looking for the first salvo of that, I'm saying, was experienced in the 60s and 70s when Sri the Prabhupada brought the Hare Krishna movement and the devotees roaring up and down the streets with their drums and their cymbals. That is precisely the kind of Dionysian pageantry that Nietzsche is calling for. And I'm saying it's not just parallel to this Dionysian parade of devotees, that it, it is what Nietzsche had in mind. And he was masking that Hare Krishna movement. He wouldn't have called it a Hare Krishna movement, but the musical celebration of Krishna, he was masking that behind this analysis of tragic Greek culture. So I know that <laughs> that's a lot, um, but to help make it more plausible that he was including a, a riddle like this. In this video, and there's going to be more to follow, I'm just going to go through uh, the penultimate section of Beyond Good and Evil. So section 295 of Beyond Good and Evil, where Nietzsche talks about his first book and how there was a reverent secret 
included in it that no one has yet discovered. That was 1886, so 14 years later, after he published The Birth of Tragedy. When he published Beyond Good and Evil, he then added a preface to The Birth of Tragedy called Attempt at a Self-Criticism, and I'll go through that. And he hints and openly says that Dionysus is just a pseudonym for some unknown god who has yet to be announced. And he goes on to call that unknown god the Antichrist. So that's what I'll do in this video. And then in the subsequent videos, I'll start analyzing piece by piece The Birth of Tragedy, which Nietzsche himself calls an impossible book. So it's not an easy task, but I do believe it's worth it because Nietzsche is trying to give us in a veiled way a portrait of his unknown God, who I'm saying is Krishna. And that this is his prescription for cultural renewal. And that his prescription is was has been being fulfilled, so I don't know what kind of grammar that was, but at any rate, since the Hare Krishna movement came to the West, and that Hare Krishna movement has had its ups and downs, but it's being fulfilled, and Nietzsche being the best philosopher since Plato in the West, in my opinion, it's important to, I think, understand his vision for the future of the Western world. And it will help people, I think, understand the importance of accepting this Hare Krishna movement. Now, I know that sounds, you know, for most people, the Hare Krishna is, is the, the archetype of uh, cult freaks. And, you know, I personally have embraced the Hare Krishna movement, but I've been always on the outskirts or what the Hare Krishnas call the fringe. But I have read all of Prabhupada's books and I've been studying them for 30 years. So what is it, 2022? Uh, 29 years. So I do think at this point, the world's the problems of the world are accelerating. The divisions in society in the United States of America and elsewhere are getting it more and more intense. The symptoms that Nietzsche said we should expect in our democratic age are becoming more and more pronounced. And his antidote, I'm saying, is more necessary than ever. It's, it's a very controversial thing to say. I've been reluctant to say it. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it now because I've been working on this. For so long, I've got to do it at some point. So, all right, I'm just going to read bits and pieces here. This is page two of the paper. So I'm uploading this paper to academia.edu. There will be a link to the paper in this YouTube video. And um, so, so that is what it is. So you'll be able to read the paper that I'm reading from here. This is page two. So let me just start reading some pieces. A Prodigy of Classical Philology writing his first book about the evolution of ancient Greek theater. Nietzsche published The Birth of Tragedy on January 2, 1872, at age 27. In 1886, he published Beyond Good and Evil, in the penultimate section of which he indicates that there is an undisclosed riddle in his first book about, now here's the quote, no less a one than the god Dionysus, that great ambiguous one and tempter god to whom I once offered, as you know, in all secrecy and reverence, my firstborn. For I have found no one who understood what I was doing then. So his firstborn is the birth of tragedy. It's his first book. He said he offered it to Dionysus, the great ambiguous one and tempter God. But he said he offered the book in all secrecy and reverence. And so there was no secret about the fact that he was worshiping the God Dionysus in the birth of tragedy. So what's the secret? As we will now see in Attempt at a Self-Criticism, the preface that he added to The Birth of Tragedy, the secret is that Dionysus is just a mask for some unknown god. He wasn't really worshipping Dionysus. He had another god in mind, and that's the riddle that no one understood what he was doing. And I'm saying the masks that he used were based on the Alexandrian-era Greeks' habit of equating Indian and Greek gods, and specifically the historian Megasthenes, who wrote the book Indica, or Indica, I don't know how it's pronounced, but at any rate, he was the one who first started equating Krishna with Heracles and Shiva with Dionysus. As we'll see, a famous German Sanskrit 
philologist Christian Lassen wrote a book called Indian Classical Studies, um, Indish Altertumskundi. I've got to look, look at it. I should know it by now, but... And he, he wrote about that. Nietzsche borrowed that book from the library in 1867 and 1868. He knew about this theory. And I'm saying that is the solution to the riddle in the birth of tragedy. And once you know that when he says Heracles and Dionysus, he means Krishna and Shiva, everything else starts to fall into place. And the other parts about his later atheism make a lot more sense. So um, with that, I will now turn to the attempt at a self-criticism. So in section one of attempt at a self-criticism, Nietzsche says, quote, as the thunder of the battle of worth was rolling over Europe, the muser and riddle friend who was to be the father of this book sat somewhere in an alpine nook, very bemused and beriddled. All right. So muser and riddle friend, bemused and beriddled. The implication is that this riddle friend fathered a book that was beriddled. There's a riddle in The Birth of Tragedy, which no one yet has even suspected was there, let alone solved. I'm saying, yes, I have discovered the riddle and I'm solving it. Is that a boast? Be it what it may, I think it's pretty clear that that is what he was doing. And I think I have established the evidence in this paper. So continuing in attempt at a self-criticism in section three of that late preface, he calls his younger self, who wrote his first book, the disciple of a still unknown God. So this is a quote, the disciple of a still quote, unknown God, unquote, one who concealed himself for the time being under the scholar's hood. So he's saying he wrote the first, the birth of tragedy. He was a disciple of some unknown God, but he pretended to be a scholar. He was writing as if he was a scholar. So the book is very impassioned. So he wasn't hiding his discipleship all that well, in my opinion. But he didn't come out and say, I'm a devotee of Krishna. He hid it beneath this philological analysis of Greek tragic theater. So philology is the study of languages and literature, the history, the evolution of language and literature. He was a classical philologist. So the classical languages, Greek and Latin, he knew also how to speak French. I think he was fairly proficient in Hebrew as a philologist. He did not know how to read Sanskrit. He had some familiarity with it. His friend, Paul Dusain, was a famous Sanskrit philologist, and I'll be talking about him in subsequent papers and videos. But he's saying, pretending, I'm saying pretending, but overtly in the attempt at a self-criticism, he's acting as an atheist. But he's saying the man who wrote his book when he was younger, the 27-year-old Nietzsche, was the disciple of a still unknown God. Okay, so... And that term unknown God is a quote from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 23... And it is where St. Paul, recalling uh, when he was trying to preach to the Athenians, he says, As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, him I proclaim to you. So Nietzsche quoted that. He obviously, as the son of a Lutheran pastor and in this lineage of other pastors, he knew his Bible. He knew that the word unknown God referred to the Athenians altar where they had that inscribed in case they missed a God. They didn't want to offend any God. So they also offered worship to the unknown God. Whatever God we forgot, the unknown God, we're giving you worship as well. St. Paul said, yeah, that's the one I'm teaching you about, the one that you worship without knowing who he is. So it's a, it's a clue that he's leaving in there. The disciple of a still unknown God. All right, so then later in section three, he goes on to say that the birth of tragedy is about, and this is a, and he said, and then so here's the quote, concealed things after which the name of Dionysus was added as one more question mark, unquote. So concealed things. Dionysus is just concealing something. Dionysus is concealing an unknown God. Who is the unknown God? All right, so now we're skipping to section five of Attempt at a Self-Criticism, and Nietzsche asks, what to call it? As a philologist and man of words, I baptized it not without taking some liberty, for who could claim to know the rightful name of the Antichrist? In the name of a Greek god, I called it Dionysian. So that's Attempt at a Self-Criticism, section five. 
So he's openly saying Dionysus is not really the god I was worshiping. I'm worshiping some other known, uh, some unknown god who is the Antichrist, but who could know the rightful name of the Antichrist? So the Antichrist has a name. That's the god that he's worshiping, but he won't tell us the name of the Antichrist. So he's teasing it out. He knows. He asks, who could know the rightful name of the Antichrist? He doesn't say nobody could. He's saying who could. I'm saying in his mind, he was thinking Krishna is the original Christ, but he's disguising Krishna as the Antichrist here in attempt at a self-criticism when he's playing the game of an atheist. Back when he wrote The Birth of Tragedy, he was calling Krishna Heracles. Okay, so that brings up an important point. Before I get to section 7, the concluding section of attempt at a self-criticism, I got to bring up this point about the name Dionysus. So in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche talks about various Greek gods, but the three most important, in my opinion, are Heracles and Dionysus, who are linked. Dionysus emanates from Heracles. And Apollo, who is Dionysus's counterpart. And Nietzsche talks about Prometheus a lot also. But in his later books, he stops mentioning Apollo and Heracles. He mentions Heracles once, but not in a philosophically significant way. He doesn't mention Apollo anymore. Walter Kaufman says in those later books, when Nietzsche says Dionysus, that Dionysus absorbs the qualities of Apollo from the birth of tragedy. And I'll get into all what are the qualities of Apollo is the god of individual forms and Dionysus is the underlying waves of will. And tragedy is the union of the Dionysian and the Apollinian. The individual and the impersonal waves of will of just raw desire the ground of being Brahman and the individuality, Atman. Atman and Brahman, this is an important concept in the Vedanta philosophy. The impersonalists say Atman's an illusion, it should be merged in Brahman. And I'm saying for Nietzsche, tragedy represents the union of Atman and Brahman, not the annihilation of Atman. And that's this is a big philosophical point, this Buddhistic negation of the will, which he talks about in section seven, is precisely what tragic culture protects us against. And he equates tragic culture with Indian Brahmanic culture in section 18, a big part of the puzzle, which I'll be getting to in other videos. But, so to keep in mind, the Dionysus that Nietzsche mentions in Attempt at a Self-Criticism and Beyond Good and Evil in his later books, I'm saying, contains all of the characteristics of Heracles and Dionysus and Apollo from the birth of tragedy. He stops mentioning Heracles in later books, but in the birth of tragedy, Heracles is the god who represents Krishna because that's what Megasthenes and the Greeks following Alexander into India called Krishna. So that is his antichrist. Krishna, he's calling the antichrist, but in fact, he believes Krishna is the original Christ. In Beyond Good and Evil, I'm just skipping ahead a little bit here because I think it's uh, pertinent right now. He says, um, you know what, I can't find it, but I know it off the top of my head. In section 40, wouldn't the opposite be the proper disguise for the shame of a god? Um, so when I find it, I'll read it again. But the idea of God wearing the mask of an atheist is a recurring theme throughout Nietzsche's books. We find it again in... Thus spoke Zarathustra, and I'll be covering all these things in subsequent videos, but the, Nietzsche definitely likes to talk about disguises and masks and fighting for a cause by fighting against it. He, he says, you know, he's always talking about lying and deceit and how that's impossible not to, and these are all parts of his philosophy. But back to attempt at self-criticism, the Dionysus, who he's calling the Antichrist, an attempt at a self-criticism, I'm saying, represents Krishna because that Dionysus contains Heracles and Apollo and Dionysus, the later books. All right, so. Um, <clears throat> so then I, I 
in this paper, I go over again what I said earlier, how he, Nietzsche came across this theory that the stories of Christ were based on the older stories of Krishna. I'm arguing that Nietzsche believed Jesus Christ himself was a devotee of Krishna, so that Nietzsche thought to serve Jesus Christ, which he trained his whole life to do, he has to embrace the God of Christ, who he believed is Krishna. Uh, on page six, I talk about how that theory of this relationship between Krishna and Christ began at least as far back as 1788, when Sir William Jones, the founder of, you know, the discoverer of the Indo-European language family, others say it was discovered earlier, but at any rate, he established it as an academic field of study, the Indo-European language family, um, and his the, the Asiatic Society of Bengal. So he established that in 1784, and then they put out the Asiatic Researches as a journal. And in the first volume in 1788, Sir William Jones says, in the Sanskrit dictionary compiled more than 2000 years ago, we have the whole history of the incarnate deity born of a virgin and miraculously escaping in infancy from the reigning tyrant of his country. So that's Asiatic Research is volume one, page 273, and I have a internet link in the footnote there. So here are the parallels between the birth story of Krishna and the birth story of Jesus in a nutshell. So miraculous birth, they were both born divinely without the need for sexual intercourse, according to the mythology of both religions. Then, an evil king, in both instances, wanted to kill the newborn godchild. And it, for Krishna, it was King Kamsa. For Jesus, it was King Herod. When they were born, in both instances, their fathers led them away to safety. So Jesus was already on his way away from Jerusalem, on his way to Egypt. And Mary went into labor in the town of Bethlehem. And Jesus was born there in a manger surrounded by animals. For Krishna, he was in the jailhouse of King Kamsa. He when he was born, he made the guards fall asleep and the doors opened magically. His father snuck him down the river to the next town downriver, Brindavan, the cowherd village of Brindavan. The town he left was Mathura. When the kings, in both instances, found out that the divine child, the newborn king, was missing. In both instances, they sent soldiers out to kill newborn babies in the town. So, Kamsa sent soldiers to kill newborn babies in Mathura, and King Herod, according to the Bible, sent soldiers to kill the newborn babies in Jerusalem. But Krishna and Jesus had already escaped. So, these philologists notice these literary parallels and they say to themselves, is it just a coincidence that these two major religions in the world and the two major characters in both of them have such similar birth narratives? Or is one of them copied on the other? So that was the debate. Sir William Jones was saying that the story of Krishna is older. Then later, Al, um, Albrecht Weber or Albrecht Weber in 1852, another Sanskrit philologist, a German Sanskrit philologist, he wrote us an article saying the other way around, that the Brahmins of India copied the Christian story of Christ. He reissued that theory in a more elaborate form in 1867. Um, Christian Lassen, another German Sanskrit philologist in 1852, responded to Albrecht Weber, and he says, well, at any rate, I can tell you that Krishna, the story of Krishna is older than Christ, and he dated that belief in the age of the Krishna myth by reading Megasthenes, and Megasthenes equated Krishna with Heracles. So when Megasthenes said people here at this time in the 4th century BCE were worshipping Heracles, Christian last and said, well, Krishna, the story of Krishna is older than Christ, Maybe the birth story is younger and was added later, but at any rate, Krishna himself, as an incarnation of Vishnu, that belief started around, according to Christian Lassen, the 5th century BC. These are all details in the world of philology 
and Nietzsche was a prodigy in classical philology, and I'm saying he was reading these Sanskrit philologists, in particular Christian Lassen, and learning about how the Greeks equated Krishna with Heracles and Dionysus with uh, uh, Shiva with Dionysus, and that is the riddle that he's put into the birth of tragedy. All right, so then, in 1869, Louis Jacolio, a French judge who lived in India for several years, he published a very popular book, La Bible dans la Inde, this is French, Vai de Isu Krishna. I, I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced in French, but it's translated as the Bible in India or the life of Isus Krishna. So Jacolio pronounced Krishna, Krishna, because he's trying to draw out the parallel between Christ and Krishna. So I don't have any evidence that Nietzsche read Jacolio's book, The Bible in India, but it's well known that Nietzsche was enthralled with Jacolio's translation of the Law Book of Manu, although he didn't read that until 1888. But he was so enthralled with that that it makes it more plausible to suggest that Nietzsche was aware of the Bible in India, which was very popular. It would have been hard for him not to have heard of it, given his interest in philology and his being raised to be prepared to be a Lutheran pastor, I'm saying it would have been culturally impossible for him not to at least have heard of this theory, given how it had created a panic in Europe. Uh, Max Mueller, I believed, I believe another Sanskrit philologist, he wrote a book review of the book, and he says, you know, this book's driving people crazy. So I'm saying around that time, 1867, 68, 69, Nietzsche reading these German Sanskrit philologists and perhaps Jacolio's The Bible in India came back to a belief in God in the form of Krishna. I also say here, Madame Blavatsky in 1875 established the Theosophical Society. She quotes Jacolio's book over 50 times in her book, Isis Unveiled, whereas Jacolio said, oh, this, he believed in God, but he says stories of miracles about Krishna and Christ and Buddha, their crafty disciples inserted those illusions. Krishna's disciples were the first ones to make up these crazy myths. Then Buddha's disciples copied Krishna's disciples, and then Jesus Christ's disciples were even more blatantly plagiaristic of Krishna's story. The parallels are so obvious you can tell. That's what Jacolio said. Blavatsky had a more spiritual interpretation, and I'm saying that so did Nietzsche, that he believed Krishna is God. He believed Buddha was Krishna's atheistic avatar, and he believed Jesus Christ did worship Krishna. That's my theory. All right, so, and Srila Prabhupada, who I'm saying is fulfilling Nietzsche's prophecies, he also believes in this theory that Jesus Christ was a devotee of Krishna, and I have a few quotes where he talks about that. All right, so with that now, um, oh, and here's this quote about about um, where Nietzsche says, I could be the Buddha of Europe. So I'm going to read now. This is page seven. In future papers, I will argue that by the time Nietzsche wrote The Birth of Tragedy, he secretly believed that Krishna is the God whom Jesus Christ himself secretly worshipped, and that later in life, when Nietzsche said, quote, I could be the Buddha of Europe, he meant the Hindu conception of Buddha as one of Krishna's Vishnu avatars, disguised as an atheist for the purpose of preparing a godless civilization to return gradually to Krishna. All right, and then here's this quote from Beyond Good and Evil. Nietzsche says, Whatever is profound loves masks. Might nothing less than the opposite be the proper disguise for the shame of a god? So when he wrote that, that's Beyond Good and Evil, section 40, that's 1886 when he published that, I believe in his mind, he was thinking of the way he was calling Krishna the Antichrist, and he was thinking of the way Krishna disguised himself as Buddha. An atheist. So then I go on to say those parts of my overall theory are much easier to defend if I can establish that in the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche secretly imitates the Alexandrian era Greeks by referring to Krishna's Heracles and Shiva's Dionysus. Once that straightforward philological riddle is revealed, the other parts of my theory fall into place more easily, thereby enabling us to behold Nietzsche's unknown God. All right, so with that, I go back to attempt at a self-criticism, now to the concluding section, which is section seven. So, in section five, he called Dionysus a mask 
for the Antichrist. So two sections later, I'm reading now page eight. This is what I write. Two sections later, he turns an about face and accuses his younger self, who wrote his first book of worshiping, not the Antichrist, but on the contrary. Now this is a quote from Nietzsche, the old God of the Christians. So I'm going to, so he begins by quoting from section 18 of the birth of tragedy. So in section seven of attempted at self-criticism, he quotes the birth of tragedy, section 18. Section 18 is where Nietzsche talks about the art of metaphysical comfort that tragic theater gave to the Greeks. The art of metaphysical comfort, the metaphysical comfort came from the openings, you know, the scenes of tragedy of people's lives are being destroyed, they're dying, and they're being tortured psychologically and physically. Why would this give the Greeks comfort? Because they realized underneath all of the changing forms of matter, their God lived eternally and joyously, joyfully. That's what Nietzsche says. The art of metaphysical comfort, that when they were watching the plays, they saw themselves as eternal servants of the God. And when the destruction of the surface appearances was occurring, it brought out by contrast the eternality of their unity with God. And that gave them a sense of metaphysical comfort. It's a big theme that repeats that I'll be talking about. But in section 18, he also talks about tragic culture being historically exemplified by Indian Brahmanic culture, which is strange. In, the, in Douglas Smith's translation and Walter Kaufman's translation, they both attach a note to that phrase. They don't, first of all, Nietzsche first wrote Indian Buddhistic culture, then he crossed it out in his own pencil and wrote in Brahmanic. And they don't understand why. They don't, why would you equate Greek tragic culture with Indian Brahmanic culture? Why don't you equate Greek tragic culture with itself? And I'm saying he doesn't equate tragic culture with itself because he's using the Greek gods as masks for the Indian gods, Krishna and Shiva, the Indian Brahmanic gods. All right, so keeping that point in mind. Now here is um, attempt at a self-criticism number seven. After quoting from the Birth of Tragedy, section 18, the older Nietzsche, feigning atheism, ridicules his younger self. So in that section, which would, it would make more sense if we read it here, but I'm just going to read what Nietzsche says. He says, even the usual romantic finale is sounded. Break, break down, return and collapse before an old faith, before the old God. Oh, you young romantics, it would not be necessary, but it is highly probable that it will end that way, that you end that way, namely, comforted metaphysically, in some, as romantics and as Christians. So he's accusing his younger self of that he says to his younger self, you most likely will end up as a Christian. It's a strange thing for Nietzsche's older self to accuse his younger self of, of happening. If it's most likely that Nietzsche's younger self is going to become a Christian, then it's most likely that Nietzsche's older self is a Christian as he's writing it. And I'm saying he did consider himself a Christian, a Christian devotee of Krishna. All right, so the old faith to which Nietzsche refers, I'm saying, is the Indian Brahmanic culture, which the popular theories of the day, including Schopenhauer and Emerson, were saying that the Christian faith is based on the older faith of the Indian Brahmanic culture, and specifically, it's based on the stories of Krishna. So said uh, Louis Jacolio, but also um, Sir William Jones, and then Albrecht Weber and Christian Lassen debated that, made it a big topic. Was the story of Christ based on the story of Krishna or not? It was a big issue in the world of philology. I'm saying Nietzsche believed that the story, the Stories of Christ were based on the stories of Krishna, not because it was just the tricky plagiarism of deceitful disciples, like Jacolio said, but that by including these literary parallels, the disciples of Christ were trying to clue people into Jesus Christ's own belief in Krishna. That's my theory. 
uh, which I'll develop as we go. But um, so that Nietzsche is saying here that his first book will likely lead people to end as Christians is strange because in section five, he called Dionysus a mask for the Antichrist. Now, all of a sudden, if you worship Dionysus as he's presented in The Birth of Tragedy, you're going to end up, you're going to end up as a Christian. It makes a lot more sense when we see Nietzsche's belief, or my theory that Nietzsche believed Christianity is based on the worship of Krishna. All right, so that is the attempt at a self-criticism. At the very least, I think that should make it reasonable to say that there is a riddle in the birth of tragedy and that when Nietzsche mentions the Greek gods, at any rate Dionysus, he means some other god, some unknown god. And that unknown god is somehow related to Christianity and I'm saying to Hinduism, specifically the Vaishnava branch of Hinduism. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for this video. And in the next video, I will start to actually analyze bit by bit the birth of tragedy itself.